Welcome. And uh, I want to start by thanking all of you who are here and all of you who are watching this uh, live streaming and all of those who will watch this for your interest in this vitally important subject. CSIS is so pleased to have Senator Michael Bennett here to discuss his new book, Dividing America, How Russia Hacked Social Media and Democracy. Russia's influence operations have been a topic of significant interest for CSIS scholars here for quite a number of years. For example, my colleague Heather Conley led the effort that led to the Kremlin Playbook, describing the range of influence operations uh, in Eastern and Central Europe, including economic coercion and corruption that in some instances led to state capture. More recently, Kath Hicks and Melissa Dalton led a team looking at gray zone activities, activities by a range of nations below the level of uh, armed conflict, um, including, of course, information operations and a series of recommendations for countering those. And I lead the Defending Democratic Institutions Project here at CSIS, where we look at adversary efforts to undermine our democracy. And specifically, we've spent the last year and a half looking at Russia's efforts to undermine public trust and confidence in America's justice system as a pillar of democracy. So we are particularly pleased uh, to have Senator Michael Bennett here, and we were pleased that he accepted our invitation uh, to speak with us about his new book on this important subject. Senator Bennett is a graduate of Wesleyan University and Yale Law School. He went on to serve as a law clerk and as counsel to the Deputy Attorney General at the US Justice Department. After a stint in the private sector as managing director for the Anschutz Investment Company, he was drawn back into the public sector as chief of staff to then Denver Mayor John Hickenlooper. He subsequently served as the superintendent of Denver's public schools. Senator Michael Bennett is currently the senior senator from Colorado having been appointed in 2009 to fill the vacancy of Senator Kenneth Salzar. And he was reelected in 2010 and in 2016. So please join me in welcoming Senator Michael Bennett to CSIS. Well, there's a whole other group of people over there. Now they can see. So, Senator, uh, really is a treat to have you here and, and looking forward to a conversation about, about this important book. But you've got a lot of important issues uh, in, in front of you as a member of the U.S. Senate. Uh, and I'm curious as to why this book and why now? I was, you know, so disturbed by the images that I saw. Um, and as I traveled the, my state and the country, I realized that nobody had seen the images. People were having a debate about the nature of the Mueller investigation. This book sort of lays out the information um, uh, by using the indictments that Mueller uses as a way of organizing it so that people can see the themes that he was focused on. But what really is important are the images here. And I was in Manchester, New Hampshire. This is a very typical thing. I was in Manchester, New Hampshire within the last two months, and I was finishing up a town hall there at a senior citizen center. And, you know, it was on a Sunday afternoon, so this is, it wasn't the biggest group of people in the world for my town hall. But at the very end, as I was walking out, this guy who's in his early 90s said, Senator, just make sure that Obama stops spending the money that was supposed to be going to veterans uh, on refugees. And this is straight out of the Russian propaganda. It's in the book, you know. Obama, stop spending money you're supposed to spend on uh, veterans for refugees. It's just an example of how much it permeated our society, which was the other thing for me that was so disturbing about the images. It's that we didn't know it was Russian propaganda for about a year until we figured it out. We couldn't distinguish this Russian propaganda from our own idiotic uh, political conversation, our own racist political conversation, 
And I think we should ask ourselves what the implications of that are for us, that we couldn't recognize the difference. And what it says about our society, that the Russians saw our pluralism, our diversity, as a weakness to be exploited rather than the strength that I actually believe it is. So that's why I decided to put these together. That and also to get Mitch McConnell to advance the election protection legislation on the floor of the Senate. I've been less successful at that, but hope springs eternal. So uh, look, sticking first with your public audience, uh, you know, the American public, uh, what is the impact that you hope that seeing the actual images, and I suspect for a number of people, uh, seeing images they perhaps had seen before, and for the first time realizing that they were produced by the Russian Internet Research Agency. Uh, as with any propaganda, I would hope that it would lead people to think twice about whether to afford it themselves. Or I hope it will lead people to think twice about what they're seeing on the, on the Internet. I get middle school kids come to my uh, office all the time, and high school kids. Or I see them in Colorado as well. And, and I often ask them, do you write papers in your classes? And if the answer is no, then we have a whole different conversation. <laughs> but if the, if the answer is yes, which it typically is, I then say, well, do you have to rely on the internet to do your research? And they say, yes, we do. And I, I say, do you have to distinguish when you're doing your research between curated facts, and we talk about what that means, edited content, or somebody just shooting their mouth off on the internet? And they say, of course we do. Why? Because our teachers will flunk us if we don't. And for years, my plea for uh, Congress has been that we subscribe to a middle class standard or middle school standard of uh, factual analysis when it comes to uh, taking stuff off the internet. And now there's a whole other layer of this because before 2016, we didn't know that the Russians and now others are using it to, for propaganda purposes. And I think it's really important for the Americans to, to be able to see it, understand it, identify it, or at least ask questions about it. But I also hope in the long run it will build public support for the legislation that we, that we need to pass to protect our democracy. Um, and uh, I hope that it will build pressure on the social media companies to do a better job of policing themselves in the absence of what may become uh, statutory and regulatory efforts to uh, contend with uh, the effect of this kind of propaganda on our politics and on our discourse through the use of those platforms. You noted that, that uh, the Russians are picking up on narratives that, that existed before they began their influence operations on social media. Uh, Pre-existing narratives, uh, a dialogue that looks indistinguishable in many instances from Americans. And in fact, what our research has shown is that they are increasingly just actually picking up authentic uh, dialogue among Americans and, and expanding that and spreading that and amplifying that when it serves their purpose, when it is the kind of divisive uh, rhetoric that they are seeking to promote, which I think does make it uh, all that more challenging uh, to figure out both whether it's from the social media platforms or, or otherwise, how to address that. Does that, um, how does that uh, affect the way you think about what social media companies should be doing to address this? Well, I think they need to do a lot more. Facebook um, uh, didn't even, I mean, they sort of laughed it off to begin with. They didn't, I mean, admit is the wrong word, but they denied that, that this was the Russians. They denied that the Russians had paid them in rubles uh, to buy these ads. and. Uh, and then when you raise issues about it with them, um, what they'll say is, well, we're just a platform. It's not our job to police this. And um, I believe that it's, it, you know, it's, when I think about, so I'm old now, I'm 54 years old, so I, when I talk about this stuff, I sound like I'm, you know, well past my cell date. But, um, but I don't believe it's acceptable for American companies in, that are as powerful as these companies are to take the position that they're just mere platforms and that there's nothing they can do about the corrosiveness on, on, on social media. When I look at the last 10 years that I've been in the Senate, you know, and that's been co corresponded with the rise in social media, it's not obvious to me that um, social media companies 
couldn't have ended up being a force for democratic good in this world and in this country. It couldn't have, um, have given people that were marginalized the opportunity to participate in the economy or in the democracy in a, in a more profound way than they were before. But that hasn't been the story for the last 10 years and hopefully it will evolve. It's been very corrosive and we see the stories just in the last couple of weeks about the ways in which the Chinese are using um, uh, this and it's turned out that the tools have been much more effectively used by tyrants than they have people in the streets and by the Russians in our case. So I do think they've got a responsibility to, to police themselves and if they don't do it, we're going to police them in some fashion and, and I think we should. The First Amendment isn't really implicated here because we're not talking about the federal government. Obviously, we have values of free exp expression that we cherish, but um, I, for one, in all aspects of our society, would like to see a less degraded uh, democracy and a less degraded conversation than the one that we're having with each other as Americans. I take it as a responsibility as an elected official to take the incoming that I get on Facebook. It's not a pretty picture, uh, and I doubt very much whether we're gonna solve the problems that our kids and grandkids need us to solve along the lines of the discourse that's happening on my Facebook page or anybody else's Facebook page, but it doesn't have to stay that way. And uh, how they respond to this propaganda and help us protect ourselves going forward into the future, I think we'll say a lot about the role they think they, they can play that's constructive in our democracy and our society. And I'm optimistic. I think they're learning from what happened and I think things will get better. Yeah, you, 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 you speak eloquently in here about the uh, fact that we, have, that we are not yet mature in using these social media tools to, to really have a more healthy and robust democracy. Uh, I, I, I have the sense, and, and, and you talk about this as well, and you, that, that Russia is practicing a kind of jujitsu here, that they are really trying to use our strength against us, the strength that comes from our, our freedom of expression, our robust marketplace of ideas, even I would say our robust and diverse voices on, the, on social media. Yeah. Um, and they are trying to convince us that we can't afford to have that that it is a weakness and, 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 and uh, you know, I think. We're, we're having that debate as a country right now. And I, 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 the more I think about it, the more I believe that this place that we are all so lucky to inhabit, you know, from, the very, from our very founding, we have had the most awesome impulses of humankind and some of the worst impulses of humankind. And it's been sort of a dialectic over 230 years about which impulse is going to um, 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 emerge, and we're in one of those moments right now. You know, when you think about the founding of this country, I, I'm trying to remind crowds of this these days. Um, the founders did not believe that we would agree with each other. That was not the proposition of, you know, why we were going to live in a free republic, in a democratic republic. Their idea was not that we would agree with each other, but that we would disagree with each other. And out of those disagreements, we would create uh, more imaginative and more durable um, solutions than any king or tyrant could come up with on their own. That was the theory of the case. And so the discourse and the debate is a really important part of that. And coming to a result is a really important part of that, as my friend Lamar Alexander from Tennessee likes to say. If you don't want to come to a result, there's no reason for you to come to Congress, you might as well just stay home and stay, you know, be on the radio if what you want to do is just have your point of view. So I think you're, they're, it's very true that what they were trying to do was exploit um, uh, the, our worst impulses, not our best impulses, and we're vulnerable to that as a society. And I, and I believe that our pluralism actually is an enormous strength in America, and that the more diverse, as you were saying, the voices are in our political decision making, the stronger we are as a country. And I, and I, I know not everybody agrees with that and believes that. I do believe that, and I, I think we'll prove it on the other side of this presidency. And you talked about the, when you go into classrooms, I, I have to say, I, I suspect those were Denver 
classrooms uh, because it sounds like those kids are getting some good media oh, literacy nice and say. digital literacy. Uh, but, uh, but what we really find is that uh, civic education has really declined in this country. As you know, there was a very good op-ed in the Washington Post just recently talking about the decline of civic education. And, and not just civic education, there's three branches of government, but, but educating our citizenry on how to have their voice heard, how to be part of that, uh, how to make that process. Um, work effectively. And it, um, so I'm wondering your thoughts on the role of, of promoting civic education and building public resilience against this kind of pernicious messaging. It's critically important. It's critically important not just so that people can understand how they can have an influence over the mechanisms of, of government and what they can do and the other citizens or, or potential citizens they can register to vote. All those things are true but also to learn our own history. I mean, that, that is so vital. People have a tendency to believe when they you know, wander around Washington, they come, the same kids come to see me, that this was all just here. And none of it was just here. You know, the Supreme Court wasn't just here. The, 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 the fact that my daughters, all three of them, have the right to vote wasn't just here. The fact that we ended human slavery, we started human slavery and perpetuated human slavery, in this country and then ended it, wasn't always here. It was Americans fulfilling their role as citizens. Um, and in my other book, uh, The Land of Flickering Lights, I contend that what that role really is, is the role of founder. That we have to think of ourselves as founders of this republic every single minute. It's that elevated a responsibility that we have as citizens in this republic. And this, I don't mean this in partisan terms. It is the opposite impulse of I alone can fix it, which is what the President of the United States uh, asserted when he ran for office the last time. I think that it's, gonna, it's very important, obviously, who is living at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue to our future. But I think what's more important than that is what role we're playing as citizens, including uh, kids that are learning uh, for the first time about our democracy and about our republic. I, I'm sorry to go on for so long, but I did one other thought. I was with my um, uh, middle daughter uh, last month at the African American History Museum here in Washington. I hadn't been there before, and we were in the first two floors. And one of the things I was thinking about as I was walking through with her was how visible all the images were to me, of the, how familiar they were to me of the civil rights movement. You know, I, I was four years old in 1968 when MLK was killed, but I, you know, in the early 70s, I could certainly, rem this was current, all of it was, and, um, and it's not in the same way to the next generation or the generation after that. And that reminds us what responsibility we all have to transmit our own history to people so that they realize, because it's never given here in a democracy, it's always something that the American people are able to build on their, build through force of their will and organization and through that spirited debate. It does, change doesn't happen any other way, whether it's guns or health care or anything else. Well, and not just change, but, but sustaining the republic, right? So your, your discussion, which you also included in this book about all of us as founders, that this is a, a process of creation that is happening every day, really resonated with me. I, I have been on this campaign to get uh, sports arenas when they play the national anthem and they put the words up to make sure to include the question mark at the end. Right? People don't focus on the fact that the national anthem starts with a question and never answers that question and a ends with the same question. Does that flag still fly yeah. over the land of the free and the yeah. home of the brave? And it is our obligation every day to make sure that the answer to that question is yes. Right? Yeah. I agree. I, was, I've been, I quote at the beginning and end of my book um, James Baldwin's incredible essay, The Fire Next Time, that he wrote in The New Yorker. At the, at the crisis years of the civil rights movement. And, and what, he, what he writes in that incredible essay is, everything now is in our hands. We have no right to assume otherwise, which I think captures perfectly what our obligations are as citizens. We have no right to assume otherwise, because if we do assume otherwise, what needs to be done won't be done. And I happen to know I've spent a lot of time with young people, and I know 
they are deeply concerned that we are not doing what we're supposed to be doing to put them in a position where they can do what they need to do, whether it's on the economy or climate or America's role in the world. Um, uh, uh, they're just worried about the position we're going to leave them in. Well, I think uh, I should have given you all a heads up that you would have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, if we've got some questions, we've got some microphones and people with microphones. We've got a question up here at the front. I'm happy you don't need to feel yourself, you don't, don't restrict yourself to whatever I talked about. I'm happy to talk about what you want to talk about. Uh, thank you very much, Senator to come. I'm from the Voice of America Russian Service. Uh, my question is, after recent Russian-Ukrainian prisoner swap, it seems that some politicians, uh, at least in Europe, uh, tempted to have uh, business as usual with, with Russia, like President Macron of France is sending his foreign minister and minister of defense for talks. Uh, and actually, President Trump is talking about possible invitation for Mr. Putin for G7 next year. Uh, what do you think about such an invitation, if it will be extended? And uh, if you're critical to it, what tools Congress has to kind of limit the possibility of it? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't think that they should be led into the G7, both because of Ukraine, but also because of this. Uh, it's, it's, it is, uh, to say the least, um, um, unfortunate that we have a president who still isn't admitting really that this happened, who stood on a stage next to Putin in Helsinki and said, I, t I don't see any reason why he would lie about it, about Putin. Uh, taking his view instead of the view of the intelligence agencies in the United States. We have now have a bipartisan report that's been released by the Intelligence Committee on which I serve that makes it very clear that this happened and who did it and that it was sustained and that it was real. Uh, and then that didn't stop the president from going to Japan and making a joke about it. So it is, and, I, and, and furthermore, I know, having spent time with um, a number of leaders from Western Europe, how worried they are about our absence of leadership on, on this topic. They know they can't defend themselves against Russia. They're very worried about um, the way Russia is inciting right-wing groups through the same kind of thing. By the way, I didn't show you any of these. Should I show just a few of these slides? Um, and so we've got to provide more leadership. I would say, Vivek, do you want to, do does all that work or no? What Congress can do, I think, to stop this is what, what we should do as an administration, if you know, we had a White House with somebody who would take this seriously, is we should be sanctioning Russia for doing this. We should be um, using our own measures to, uh, to, that, are, that are equivalent, not, not, not identical, but to push back on what they've done um, so that they know that there's a penalty for doing it. Uh, and we should be leading our European allies in their fight against this as well. I think that's what we should be doing. And Congress wants to pass, not, not all of Congress obviously, but the, we have bipartisan legislation in the Congress that would do things like shore up our uh, election infrastructure uh, at the local level against this kind of attack. Uh, that would allow us to, to require, um, it would require um, campaigns to notify the FBI if they had this sort of uh, interaction with the Russians. And Mitch McConnell won't put it on the floor. It's bipartisan. I'd love to see which United States Senator uh, doesn't want to vote for this election protection legislation. I'd love to see it, um, which is why we should have a debate. This is one of my favorite ones. This is NASCAR Jesus that, uh, given to you by the Russians. It has the NASCAR sign and Jesus holding an assault weapon in one hand and a Mountain Dew in the other hand. This is a series of, of and this is, there are a whole series of these that were targeted to suppress the African American vote uh, all, over, all over America. You know, the Russians, they, they didn't care. They were on every side of every issue. So you'll see 
um, uh, ones where they, where, where they are supporting Black Lives Matter, and then you'll see others that, where they're taking the police department's view. All they care about is fomenting the, the, dis, the divisions and the dissensions. This is based on a, a real op And by the way, the, as those of you that are historians know, the Russians are, have been unbelievable uh, propagandists from time immemorial, and this is a, a really stunning piece of propaganda, I think, that was based on an op-ed piece that ran in the New York Times. This you may not have known, no, yeah, did you know Nobel Peace Prize winner Bar President Barack Obama dropped over 23,000 bombs on majority Muslim countries. Most of what they ran was anti-Muslim, anti-Islam stuff, but um, they ran things like this too. Thanks. Yes. Oh, there's one. Oh, sorry. I, I think it's, it's great, a great question and a great point. Um, somebody asked me the other day what my favorite app is. And by far my favorite app is Waze. <laughs> the, the most boring app you could pick. Except during rush hour when it really No, that's down. when it's particularly my favorite app. Like, it is, somebody told me once, they said, Michael, when you hire a pollster, you have to believe your pollster. And if you don't believe your pollster and your politician, you should get rid of your pollster. But if you keep your pollster, you have to believe them. You can't simultaneously hold on to your pollster and doubt what your pollster is reporting to you. That's how I feel about Waze, exactly how I feel about Waze, which is I've given myself up to Waze, which means that when I'm trying to get here at 5.30, and I now know I'll be here at 5.32, and there's nothing I can do about it, <coughs> I have no stress, whereas two years ago I would have been a complete mess on the way over here. But I have not, in my mind, contracted with Google, even as notwithstanding how much I love Waze, uh, to allow them to know everywhere I've been or where I'm going, you know, this evening. And they are taking the view that I have contracted with them. My, my view is that if I have, it's a contract of adhesion, not one that I've actually negotiated with them. And I believe we are about to have a really interesting debate in America and in the Congress about the issues that you raise. And it is going to be absolutely fascinating because um, so much of it is going to, I mean, my kids' view of privacy is very different from my view of privacy. It's very different from my view of what their view of privacy should be as they think about their interaction with the internet. But um, I, I, we are going to move into a new era, I, I think, where the, the guiding principle, which has been you have no right to complain as long as what you're getting is free, um, is going to turn out not to be the guiding principle anymore. And people, it's not just going to be about private, private, private privacy issues. It's going to be about who gets the benefit of monetizing these issues, this data, who gets the benefit of the economics. And we are at a very early phase on this, but, but I can tell you there are people on both sides of the aisle who are thinking hard about the privacy question that you raised. Yes, we had a question here. Thank you very much, Senator, for coming. My name is Jackson Richmond. I'm a reporter with Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. Uh, so I'm going to ask uh, a couple of questions that, um, not related to your talk. Um, Jack, I apologize, but I didn't hear where you were from. Sorry. Oh, Jewish News Syndicate, okay. JNS.org. Yeah. Uh, my first is, what's your reaction to uh, John Bolton being ousted as National Security Advisor? And my second is, if elected president, would you re-enter the United States and see the Iran deal, keep the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem, and keep the president's recognition of the Golan Heights? Um, 
the on the first question I don't have a reaction except that it's more chaos at the White House and when you've had more national security advisors than you've had years in the White House uh, it suggests why we may seem to lack a strategy when it comes to much of anything whether it's China or Russia or the Middle East so um, that's the extent of my reaction to that so the second question um, I, I thought it was a terrible decision the president made to um, abandon the Iran deal. Um, I never thought the Iran deal was perfect. I uh, had concerns about its limit, its, its, the limitation of time. I had concerns about its scope. Um, but um, when I voted for it, there was a lot that was unknown about what the Iran what Iran's compliance with the deal would look like. And those unknowns were knowns by the time Br President Trump became president. And what was known was that the Iranians had been pushed back uh, in terms of the breakout to a nuclear weapon by almost a year. For, they had gone from two to three months to a year, which is really vital because when it's two or three months, it's hard to, um, it's very hard to mobilize allies in that frame of time to be able to react. When you have a year, you have the time to be able to do it. And I think very unfortunately, we've now put, been put in the position of putting the Iranians in um, the position to decide how provocative they want to be and where they want to draw the lines. And they're not surprisingly being provocative. I always believed that the conventional threat they posed to Israel and the conventional threat that they posed uh, to the region and the U.S. would be far worse backstopped by the possibility of their acquiring a nuclear weapon than not acquiring a nuclear weapon. And now we find ourselves in the position of their beginning to enrich again. We've also um, see this daylight between ourselves and our allies who negotiated this deal. I don't think any of that is good for the United States and for our strategic interest. Um, in, in the region, and I'll get back to you on the other two questions. I want to give you a considered answer. Right here, in the front. <coughs> Hi, uh, Senator Bennett, uh, Jacqueline Kerr, I'm an incoming AAAS fellow uh, in DC. Um, I um, wonder if you might have an example or examples of optimal measures uh, that have been taken in the U.S. or in other countries, other democracies, to counter this sort of disinformation, either by government regulatory or in the private sector or in public-private partnerships, and also any examples of measures that would be detrimental or that uh, seem risky. And um, I also wanted to ask whether you thought um, privacy, data privacy protections of the sort you were just discussing might play a role in uh, building a greater sort of hardening and resilience against this sort of micro-targeting and might be used I'm, as part I'm of a solution. On the last point, I, sorry, please go ahead. Sorry, it might be part of a solution. Yeah, I do. I mean, on the last point, I think absolutely. And even, even before you get to the privacy um, uh, questions, there's no reason why foreign actors and foreign governments should be able to buy political advertising on social media sites that advertise in America, there's no reason. They shouldn't. That should be illegal. And that's not even a privacy issue. That's just, a, we, we can regulate that here, and we should. And people should have to follow the same road, rules of the road, I think, on social media in terms of advertising that they do on other platforms. And they ought to be, have to tell us who they are and who paid for the ads. So. Um, as you were saying earlier, Suzanne, you know, this is a worry for me because d democracy is much more fragile in some ways than other forms of government to this kind of, this particular kind of um, insidious activity. And that's why we have to be on guard. I am not aware of any good examples of folks uh, taking this on. I've been told that there are um, some, you may know this, that there are some countries in Eastern Europe where in the evening, there are now television channels dedicated to exposing um, what lies Russia told that day in their countries, which I can tell you, I would love to have that kind of, uh, 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 not just about the Russians, but other people that <laughs> lied during that day about our country. But that would be fascinating, you know, and people watch it because they know that it's vital to 
understanding what's going on in their country. And I wouldn't be surprised to see things like that begin to spring up here. One of the reasons why it's so important for us to pass some of this election protection legislation that the majority leader is not allowing us to pass is that Montgomery, Maryland, and that's a fairly wealthy, I just mentioned it because it's here. I mean, they can't take on the Russian internet service by themselves. You think about rural counties in this, in this um, uh, country and the vulnerability they have to Russian attack and attack by others. They can't do it on their own, and they need help. It's a matter of coordination uh, led by Homeland Security and the Justice Department, but also with the resources that are necessary to harden um, our, our election, both software and hardware. Um, that's work that we have to take on as well. And I think it would help. By the way, I should say, we did a better job in 18 than we, it should be said, even though we have a president who denies that this actually happened, we did a better job protecting the country in 18 than we did in 16 because, because of the diligence of the men and women that serve our intelligence agencies. And while the threat is gonna evolve and change between now and 2020, I can tell you they are on it in, in, a, in a way that they weren't in 2016, which is a help. Yes, right behind. Well, thank you very much, Senator, and thank you very much for uh, CSIS for hosting this forum. So I'm Chen with Phoenix TV. We're the largest Hong Kong-based television channel. And my question is actually regarding the current China situation, as uh, you have mentioned in the debate and also before, uh, that we, the, the U.S. needs to fix the relationship with China, and China and uh, um, the Chinese challenge is a serious one. So, but you think that the current trade war isn't the right way to deal with it. So, in your opinion, what is the right approach? Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> I think that. D Donald Trump was right to call the question that he called on China, but I think he did it in a, in a completely unproductive way. And when I say I think he was right to call the question, what I mean by that is ever since China, we, we had a theory as a country that when China entered the WTO in the early 80s, I think it was 1984, I'm not exactly right. What was it? 2001. 2001. A theory that um, that they were going to adopt the rules of the road or the rest of the world, and they never have in terms of uh, trade. And uh, we have to stand up for our own economy, I think. And there are a lot of other countries in the world that feel that way as well. And I think we share equities with countries all over the world, Europe and 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 Asia. I mean. Nobody in Asia is interested in being dominated, you know, in a unipolar world by China. They'd much rather be in a, in a bipolar world where the U.S. and China both have an important role to play. So I think that we could lead the entire world, basically, um, in, a, in an effort to push back on China's mercantilist trading practices and say not what the president is saying, which is we're, we're, we're upset that you're growing, but to say that we know that you're gonna grow, we know that as you grow, you present an, an important opportunity for us as an export market, but as you grow, we're gonna expect you to uh, adhere to a set of rules that the rest of us are adhering to. And whether it's state-sponsored uh, companies, whether it's um, uh, the theft of intellectual property and all the other uh, challenges that we're confronting, um, including ones related to this, um, that we're going to be much more aggressive pushing back than we've been. Uh, we have put ourselves, I think, in a, in a bad position in this trade war. That's my view, uh, because of the way the president has handled this. And if you don't agree with that, ask yourself who you think has a, a longer attention span, Beijing or Donald Trump? Uh, and that will tell you what you need to know about where we are right now. So how about back here in the middle? Hello, my name is Robin Dickey. I'm a graduate student at Johns Hopkins SICE down the street into Colorado. Oh, where are you from? Uh, Denver, Aurora. Great. 
And so my question is on kind of a parallel social media issue to Russian interference, and that's the recent debates about far-right, more domestic extremism that we've seen on the um, social media platforms. Yeah. And I was wondering your thoughts on how that is comparable um, and how it differs in how we would face it to the Russian interference question. Well, it's different because uh, uh, it's not Russian propaganda, and and there, there, um, that may have implications for how policymakers think about what they want to do. I don't think it's okay that there's a bunch of white supremacist stuff on on social media. That's my view, and I think that if I were the board of directors of Facebook or the founder and CEO of Facebook. And I knew I had a, the kind of uh, influence that I have in this society. I would want to make it as constructive as that influence could be, not destructive. And I would want to exercise responsibility. And I realize that there are challenges with what I just said. I mean, because it assumes that you've got benevolent leadership, not malevolent leadership. And that can be dangerous because what if you have malevolent leadership. But as a parent, more than as a uh, senator, uh, I think that having this stuff just go onto social media completely unfettered um, isn't an acceptable answer. Um, it's not an acceptable answer to me that you can watch somebody having their head chopped off on social media. And we, we haven't had any rules of the road here, basically, at all. And We've now got to start putting some in place. I don't know what they are, but we, we will benefit, I think, our country will benefit from having a debate about this, as we were talking about with the gentleman over there about privacy. I think it's long overdue, and we have to have it. We have to have a, a debate about tech generally, too. You know, you've got, you've got um, if you look at the return on invested capital in this country in, in term, in, by publicly traded companies, which is a fancy way of saying the profits that publicly traded companies make on the money that they invest, if you look at that throughout history, those lines basically are flat from the most profitable to the least profitable co companies. Because if you start to get an outsized profit, somebody else will come and compete down your profit. That's how a capitalist society is supposed to work. Since 1995, if you look at the, the people that are the most profitable country, co companies, their profit line has gone straight up like this, which suggests to me there is a massive distortion going on in terms of our capitalist system because there's nobody who can compete their profit down. And whether that's because they've got a huge head start because of the data that they've collected or a huge head start because of they're, you know, where they are in the marketplace. or, But it's a question we should be asking. Uh, I don't think we should be jumping to the conclusion that they should be broken up, but we should be asking ourselves about the role they're playing in our society and, and whether, it's, whether it's as beneficial as, as it could be. We have time for one more question. Joseph Gordon from the National Intelligence University. I wonder what lessons we can learn from our successful information operations in the Cold War. We have nothing that compares today to uh, Radio Free Europe, for USIA, for all of the activities that we, we took information warfare, both offensive and defensive, seriously. I don't think we have even begun to address this seriously as a nation. What do you recommend that we could no, I, I'd say that's true. I'd say that's true. And we're living in a moment where we are looking inward when the rest of the world is still relying on us. Much of the rest of the world is still relying on us for leadership. And my view of that is that, um, um, uh, that we can repair a lot of this notwithstanding this four-year interregnum, I think it's going to be much harder to do eight years from now than it is four years from now. Again, I, that is not a partisan observation. It's just a difference of view. You know, This president has had a very different view about what our engagement in the world should look like compared to Democratic and Republican presidents over the last 70 years. And I think it's fair to say that if there were a 
different Republican president in the White House um, in four years, that our approach to these matters would be very different, including the kind of uh, efforts that you're talking about, but also the leadership that our, you know, that 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 that. that uh, that our allies, that our Western democracies around the world need us to provide, not to mention countries uh, in Asia as well who are looking for us to provide some leadership there. And we've, in the back end of TPP, essentially abandoned that and we don't have a theory about how to replace that. We've also got a big job to do in our hemisphere too. And the ambassador would be interested to know this, but everywhere I go in every conversation that I have, of somebody brings up the refugee crisis at our border. I mean, it's one of the first things that people want to talk about. And um, the U.S. has an enormous role to play here in terms of not just relieving the immediate refugee crisis that we're facing, but the underlying issues in the Northern Triangle countries that, um, that are causing people to flee for their lives to our border. And we've got a national security interest in doing that. Uh, not to mention the humanitarian interest in doing that. And all of this, whether it's the kind of things you're talking about or the stuff that I'm talking about, all of this is going to be much easier to do and much more uh, constructively done if we forge strong alliances around the world with our allies. And we're living in a moment where, for some reason, we're turning our back on our allies and forging you know, these weird relationships with people that have our, you know, don't have our interests at heart, whether it's North Korea or Russia or, or anywhere else. So, anyway, I got off topic, but that's why I think that's why I think we need to make a change, and I think it's why we have to not be so careless with our democracy next time. And that's what this book was mostly about, which is let's not be so careless with our democracy. Excellent advice, and. Uh, Really appreciate your challenge to all of us to continue to think of ourselves as founders of this ongoing uh, experiment here, and particularly for your time today. I know you've got a, a, just a few things going on, and we I really actually this was a joy. It. I started the day having a root canal, which I <laughs> and I knew I knew that I was not living the life I should lead when I um, came to think of that time as a vacation <laughs> uh, rather than a root canal. So this was much nicer than that. So thank you. Well, thank you.